Hi, I'm Julie Barrow, and with me is Stephanie Poyman Law, and Stephanie is our June 2015 artist, and her show is called Immortal Ephemera. Anyway, she and I are going to talk briefly about her show. Uh, we just closed her opening um, art reception for, um, for her show this evening, and uh, we talked a lot mostly about her Insecta series and the... Uh, Oh, I, I think you probably can explain it a lot better than I can. <laughs> um, but ultimately about the bug uh, being a part of our world in so many levels. Uh, just being there for one thing. It's yeah. very... It was, it was mostly about just the, the overlay, the juxtaposition between insects as you know, their physical incarnation and this is contrasted against the sort of mythological creature that we have and it's sort of deified in a way and it's this thing that we brush aside in our daily lives and don't really consider it much. But on the other hand, we have all these stories and myths, myths and folktale and folklore beliefs about them. I mean, everything <laughs> from like, what is it, the grasshopper and the ant to, yeah. you know, the busy Fables. bees. The, the, yeah, yeah and, uh, and then the things that they create, whether it's honey, uh, you know, sort of that it's the magical elixir is what it, you know, exactly. You and... talked about that whole group of dragonflies flying over your head that had you not looked up, it just would have happened. And yeah, passed by. it's just like a different perspective of the world, and just trying to look outside of your your usual range, your usual field of vision. Uh, whether that be up, down, smaller, larger things than you're used to, and just kind of reaching outside of that box. And in, in also in that vein, you also did a lot of experimenting with medium, um, pushing yourself outside the box, uh, sometimes I think almost literally with the birch panels, where you were starting to paint on things other than just paper. Yeah, you know. and people are surprised. They say, this is watercolor? <laughs> How did you do that on wood? <laughs> so, but yeah, I love painting on different surfaces and experimenting with different textural mediums and just trying to change it up and give myself different, different launching boards to move from so that you know, I can explore them and just see where it takes me. Now, one of the things that I'm going to ask you that's sort of a weird thing, you probably don't get this this often, because you're, you do so much work that nobody would ever think of the fact that you might have an experiment that goes horribly wrong and that might wind up in the garbage. Now, do you ever have a time where you're working on something and you're like, oh, no, this is not going to work? Every all. painting. <laughs> <laughs> Every painting has this phase um, and it's this, this point where I hate it. Like, I start on painting. And I, I'm really excited about it. I have this concept, I sketch it out, I spend all this time on it, and then I start painting. And then I hate it. And I'm like, this is, this is awful. I should just toss this. It's not, gonna, it's not gonna be anything like I'm envisioning, and it's just worthless to keep going. But I know, I've, I've experienced this enough now, that I know that every painting has this sort of dark phase. <laughs> And I have to work through that, and I know that if I just keep persisting, that it eventually gets through that, and it gets to the place that it needs to be. But you have to sort of have faith that if you keep going, that you can get through that part. And I think you can give up too early mm -hmm. if, you just, if you just chuck something and, and say, it's not worthwhile to complete. But most pieces that I do have this, this time period where I have to just sort of struggle through it. And that's, that's one of the things that was hardest for me um, when I became a parent, is that I couldn't struggle through those times. Like I, I needed, I, I wanted to just keep going, keep going with peace, and just kind of keep moving through it, plowing through it, until I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. But sometimes I just have to like start and stop on a different schedule than mine, and that was one of the hardest things for me to really get used to. <laughs> to kind of let go on, yeah. like, okay, it's just yeah, going to it's just like, happen. Just step back. Let it go for now. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, have you had any interest or inclination to try different things or maybe more sculpt sculptural? Um, I'm not totally just in wash just because I, I like the transparency of watercolor. That's the thing that really draws me in for it. It's what makes watercolor so luminous um, and it makes them glow. And it's not something you'd see really in, in a digital translation of it, so it's something that you see in original paintings. 
which is I'm, I'm really excited to be able to show here because people, I can, I can share that with people. And it's something that you miss out on when you don't see the original paintings. Oh, yeah, um, I agree. So in front of the original, it's, it's something that interacts with the light now. Um, and watercolors always do that. That's what the transparency is about. It kind of interacts with the way light strikes the paper and through the pigments. So that, I think, is why the original are so different from reproductions. But now, with other um, aspects, textural and light, um, in terms of reflective aspects of them adding in, you get even more of that. And it's when you're standing in front of a piece, it shifts when you move, when you change your location, when you look at it differently. So there's and there's a little bit of yeah. a roughness. I notice a lot of times with prints and reproductions, there's things get kind of normalized in the printing process. So if you have a metallic, for example, you miss some of the, and I don't want to say raggedness, but the way the light will hit it, it will hit it at, at almost different frequency, different quality, in different areas, which is with, like with metallic golds and things, yeah. depending on what the surface is like. It'll change, whereas when you have a print, it's all smooth. It's all normalized and flattened a little bit. Yeah. So the, the goals look the same no matter what part of the paper you're looking at because there's not that textural element to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people... That's the light striking it from different angles. Yeah. You lose that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think also too the other question that people have other than, you know, when are you going to have a new book? When are your new products coming out? Are you looking at more product work versus um, uh, actual art. Um, you know, you're very prolific in general, uh, but because of your past working as an illustrator and creating books and, and games and things like that, you're going to get a lot of, of course, the questions of what are you working on next and uh, do you have a sort of like a top track for that? My, my products have always been very art driven and that has always been even in my early days of you know, being an illustrator, it's always been driven by what I wanted to create. And I've, over the years, I've gotten more freedom to focus and to, to direct my own projects and to really push those. So, fortunate to have that. <laughs> Did you ever have a time where you were mortified at changing gears a little bit, where you were taking less of the contract work and doing more of what you want to do. I know that's a very terrifying step for some illustrators, especially if they've been doing a lot of commercial art for a long time and that's almost their identity is woven into it, you know? Um, did you have a point where you're like, am I doing the right thing? No, it was a pretty natural progression for me because um, all the, the contract work that I took on was always my style uh, and art directors kind of seemed to know that this was the work that they were going to be getting when they when they contacted me. So it it always had that element to it, and mm -hmm. so it was a fairly easy transition for me to move from that to focusing more and more on my personal work. And then, you know, the past five years is when I've mostly transitioned almost completely to that. One of the things you have done, which is huge, is do things like uh, create, for instance, your tarot deck, which was a big project. Yeah. And, um, a lot of people always want to do tarot, you know, everyone's like, oh, I want to do a tarot deck, and they don't think about the amount of cards that are in a deck, and the amount of work that takes, and um, you did a fairly detailed colored deck, and um, uh, how do you keep yourself on, on target with a project of that magnitude? I mean, was it something that you did straight from the beginning to end for five months straight, or was it something that you worked on for a while, or... I've had like a rough timeline for myself, and I'm I'm a little weird in my scheduling and timelines. <laughs> I cannot I cannot handle having things just like loom over me, and, and I need to plan them out. So I did plan it out fairly in fairly detailed um, ahead of time, and I knew it actually took me a little bit longer than I expected. It. Originally, I I gave two it about weeks. two years. No. <laughs> <laughs> <New. laughs> Originally, I told myself I was going to take about two years to do it, and, and that, on that schedule, it would be every other week would be a painting. Oh, is that right? Um, so about two? No, that would be three years, I think. Um, okay. Approximately. So, tarot, basically, I had, I had my clients, and then whenever I wasn't working on those projects, I was doing tarot. And I could constantly keep in the back of my brain 
moving, the next idea for the next card, what's the next one going to be? So it, it takes me, in general, the actual painting only takes a couple days, mm -hmm. but I always need this kind of, you know, back of the brain churning time where I'm thinking about what it's going to be, what the colors are going to be, what the composition is going to be. And so that would happen you know, while I'm working on another painting so that every other week approximately I was able to start painting one of the tarot pieces. Right. And I did them in order from the Fool up to the World right. in the order that they appear in the deck because one of the things I, I realized early on was that there are some cards that don't connect to me, at least not initially when I think about it. And I didn't want to have... If I did all my favorites, right, which is really easy to do, then you'd be stuck <laughs> with stuck the ones <laughs> of oh my god, yeah. the two of swords, exactly oh all the ones that you were dreading, and then right. it would never happen. It would never, you would never finish it. So instead of trapping myself into that, I purposely went in order and didn't give myself any excuses for skipping. If I did like a card, I had to find a way to like it, which is what you have to do with contract work. Anyway, you, you right. find ways. You find what appeals to you and what you like in doing that piece. And so for me, this was my project and I still had to, I had to do that. I had to find ways to connect and, and really the reason for each piece. Right. And I think people see that in the final product. I mean, it's interesting because I have people coming up to me and saying that it's, it's a really, that they can connect to it on an intuitive level mm -hmm. because they connect to each image and I think it's because I try to find a way for myself to connect to each image like that. Right, and, and that actually goes right into a, the question I had in terms of a long-term project like that is how did, when you're starting in the beginning and then four years later, later you're doing the last one, how do they all connect on the style, the, the, yeah, the palette, <laughs> you know, where like, okay, four years have passed and now this yeah. looks totally different than this piece, um, how do you keep the, the stylistically, stylistically without yeah. confining yourself. Um, that was actually one of the things I worried about and why I hesitated. I, I mean, I had the idea to do a deck for a couple of years before and I hesitated on it because I felt like my style was really still developing and I was still trying to figure out where I was going with it and I didn't want to jump onto that too quickly and trap myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm fortunate that over the course of those four years, it didn't change too drastically. I mean, things did change, um, but like from the end of that to four years afterwards, it was another huge drastic change. And so it's, <laughs> I guess you just cross your fingers that yeah, it's all going to stick together. <laughs> and you can hold, hold on to it until the end. <laughs> um, but I think it, it works as a cohesive, a, a cohesive world. And oh, I yeah. Think they all did manage to stick together path, let's say, in the next few years um, as being very linear, or do you see it as very, almost like the Nautilus, you know, where you just kind of, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's more of a meandering path. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, do you feel like you will always continually have a, a connection to nature? Um, I think so. I mean, that seems to have been pretty consistent throughout all my art making. It's always been something that's been really important. And movement, mm -hmm. um, flow of things, which comes from my dancing. I think I, I like I like how compositions have motion and move through a piece and how it takes your gaze through it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are both important elements that have been pretty static throughout all my art making career. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and I think also too I'm wondering, um, in terms of that, I notice you're getting more and more micro, uh, microcosm oriented. Yeah. In, in microcosm as macrocosm, where you're looking into the littler parts of the world, but pulling it out, it, it kind of stretching it out, making it bigger, and, yeah. and, and uh, whether it's, um, you know, bugs or... Um, well, what was funny was, like, I started with some pieces, and I had, I had like, a little honeybee about this big, and it was big at first when I did it, because it's like, whoa, that's what, 10 times bigger than a real honeybee. Right, exactly. <laughs> and then I did another piece, which was you know, this big. Like, no, it's still not big enough. I want to really stretch it out and really you know, dive into that and see all those juicy little details and things and, and make it something so, like, beyond, larger than life. Um, and I feel like I still haven't reached the limit of that. I want to make it even bigger now. Well, it's interesting you made that, <laughs> uh, like, in, uh, when, what was it, when flowers 
from a flower stream. Dream. Yeah. And you've got this giant bee, but then you have little tiny people, which on the flip side, it's the other way around, of course, right? You know, it's a little tiny yeah. and we're all big, and then you've got these little human figures kind of wafting through and um, where you've, you've got that flip going. Yeah. And I don't know if that was an intentional thing or just as you were imagining, you know, what what's going through the mind of this, you know, plant. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, that was due to Lewis Carroll and um, Hans Christian Andersen, because I was reading, I was reading some stories to my daughter. We were just reading uh, *Through the Looking Glass*. Oh, nice! And *The Snow Queen*. Mm -hmm. And both of these have these elements in them where the flowers are talking about their dreams. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, the hoity-toity. The yes. yes. <laughs> the well, I guess those aren't talking about things, but the ones in *The Snow Queen* are. And right. What they see when they were underground sleeping, what strange dreams they must have um, you know, if they were to speak and, and to have. You know, express these. Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. And to them, you know, the insect is this large thing, and that's the major element in their lives, whereas humans are just passing by. <laughs> yeah, oftentimes squishing them, yeah. killing them, doing all kinds of horrible things yeah. to them. Not sometimes feeding them, but you know, feeding them then cutting their heads off, <laughs> sticking it. Yeah, that's getting weird. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's right. That's how I roll. You know. And I yeah. I really again. I really appreciate you talking with me and taking the time after, you know, a really long day today um, in the studio to, and you do it, you did a lot of talking today as well, so, you know, so sitting here with me and talking about your work and um, just for the record, the, the uh, show here it opens June 13th and ends on July 3rd. Uh, 2015, not 2016, like I said earlier. Um, and uh, Stephanie, of course, uh, will continue to be doing your work. You've got your your website, uh, shadowscapes.com. Yes, so people can keep watching her. Uh, she's always posting what she's working on almost every day. I think you have something that you show, which is pretty freaking amazing. <laughs> and real quick, how did you guys meet? Oh, it was a bar. <laughs> <laughs> for for um, quite a while, uh, at least um, since the early 2000s, uh, because of the fairy world, and you were doing a lot of fairy art, or in that sort of relative genre, and I was doing, at the time, uh, a, a certain amount of fairy art as well, although not quite as intensely. And um, and so I was aware of, 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 of you and your work. And um, and then around the time when we did the fairy show, uh, I can't remember what you had sent in. Yeah, yeah, it was the fox, the one with the foxes. I can't remember the name of that one. Uh, the one with the foxes is what you sent in. It's, right? it's been a long day. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's green? Yeah. <laughs> Boxes in it, <laughs> and and it has a woman. It has trees and some trees. Yes, it had one big tree. Tree. Firefly hunters. Firefly hunters. Yes, right. <laughs> People asking me when you know when's the next Stephanie? Are you gonna bring her back? Blah, blah, blah. And, and and I was like, well, shoot, yeah. And you were like, I don't know. I remember you were a little bit nervous about it, and <laughs> then you said, okay, I'll do it, and um, and so we agreed on March of 2014. <laughs> I got that one right. And um, and then she flew out here, and I got to meet her for the first time. And uh, I think we had maybe met very briefly before your show. I want to say that probably at FerryCon. At FerryCon, yeah, yeah. FerryCon West. Uh, so it, it came out that year. Yeah, and I think I met you through Robert Gould and through Tara Lars Larson Chain. Yeah. And um, but it was very quick. It was like oh, okay. I think it was like the month right before my show though. Yeah, <laughs> and we were all like, whoa, crazy. And um, and I hope, of course, that we get more opportunities to hang out in yeah, the future. I love Seattle. Like every time I come here, everyone has been so amazingly welcoming, and I feel completely at home here. Oh, awesome! <laughs> awesome. Thank you again. Thank you. And thank you, people, for watching this. This will be heavily edited because of all my bloopers. <laughs> so keep watching for the be real. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, you're not. No, I'm not. <laughs> anyway, thank you again, and um, until next time. Been our very first ever. You're always our first. You were guinea pig. Yes, she was our first artist talk. Oh. Now she's our first um, sort of.
chip chat, tea time, chip chat. Yeah, special. Hey, tea. <laughs> you don't get any tea. It's too hot. I need chocolate too. You just had chocolate. We still have before. chocolate. <laughs> we had sangria. We had sangria. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, Alexa makes that bar. Oh, I know. I was telling you. <laughs> you should hear her bar name. <laughs> She's like, it's like Stephanie Lies and they're normal, but like her bar name is is Marge. <laughs> so they have stories about her. She's got just like a whole other world. Um, but yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll hit the button. All right. For real.